Well, it's a sign of how exciting it is to be here at TEDx that you know, you've intimidated a robot. Um, and that's not easy to do, because Bandit is not easily intimidated, but we'll see about that in a minute. What I really want to talk to you about today is something that hopefully you haven't heard much about yet, but hopefully we'll hear a great deal about in the next few years. And that is a unique niche for social robots in improving human health and quality of life. So there's a wonderful article in the New Yorker last November called Robots That Care, and I think that's a really good catchphrase for what I want to talk about. And that is the idea that we can use social robots to address a really huge healthcare need. So who's heard about issues with healthcare? Anyone? Anyone? Yeah, there, there's that healthcare thing out there. And we haven't figured it out yet, I think it's safe to say. So let's think about some of the challenges. Um, one of them is that we have 800,000 new strokes per year right now. That number will double in the next 20 years with the aging population. Um, we have literally millions of people with Alzheimer's, and that number two is going to double or more in the next few decades. And then on the younger side of things, for example, one in every 100 children today is diagnosed with autism spectrum disorder. Um, it, it was one, one in 150 just two years ago. It is now one in 100. So that's a very scary trend. Um, these are all individuals who have special needs throughout their lives, and their lives can be very long. Um, and so who is going to help them? So I would like to say one source of help will come from social robots. So I want to tell you about robots that don't touch. There's no touching, no touching. I'm not touching Bandit, Bandit is not touching me. And that's very important because touch is complex. It's complex technologically, it's complex in terms of safety. But there's a lot you can do to help without any physical contact. So what can you do? Well, for example, robots can monitor decreasing the risk of injury, early detection of conditions throughout life. Uh, robots can coach, as you will see, they can help people regain, gain, regain, and maintain function. Everything from social behaviors with kids with autism, all the way to post-stroke rehabilitation and Alzheimer cognitive function retention. Um, they can really boost your motivation, and that's something that we have found already working with all of these populations. We have had stroke patients get excited about really boring, re repeatable exercises when, when they do the exercises with the robot. And I'll do a few exercises with the robot in a minute, and you'll see just how exciting that is, I hope. Um, and also, in general, the idea that you have to adhere to some kind of a regimen, whether it's a weight loss program, this being currently the one condition that no one knows how to fix, um, there's really nothing out there provably works. Um, maybe robots will do it. Um, or whether it's recovery from some trauma or who knows what it is, but you know, you're going to need some help. And then finally, companionship. There's a lot of isolation and depression worldwide. And again, we think that maybe your personal social robot can make a difference. So um, this is our vision of human-centered robotics. And the idea is to make this very affordable. So you're looking at Bandit now and you're thinking, well, besides the fact that it's easily intimidated, um, how much does it cost? And of course, this thing costs a lot. But the idea is that this technology can be made for the price of a laptop in quantity. So this really should be affordable and accessible for everyone. And it's a lot more affordable than getting therapy on a daily basis, which is not affordable for most people. So the idea here is to help to bridge the gap in human care. Not to replace human care, but there isn't enough human care available. So we really want to improve health outcomes and decrease health care costs by improving quality of life. So we've done this with stroke patients already. Um, we have shown that robots can actually get real stroke patients. We've worked with a, a large stroke study at USC. Real stroke patients um, do longer exercises, have fun. They try to trick the robot. They try to cheat. The robot doesn't let them. Sometimes it lets them a little bit, gets their motivation going, but then it tells them, oh, no, I saw that. And then they go, wow, how does it know? So we have great videos of this on the web. Um, you too can try to trick a robot. I challenge you, but not this one, because this one's intimidated, but um, another one. So we have quite a few on campus. And so importantly, we've demonstrated that this could really work for motivating stroke therapy. Um, and I should mention that everyone who's had a stroke, and remember that large number, um, people need to exercise many hours a day in a supervised fashion. So this could really make a difference. Um, another niche that we work in is elder care. Um, everyone has someone that in their family, and we all will be in that position, hopefully, um, who will need care one-on-one uh, -on -one from some kind of combination, really, it's a village of people and technologies. And there are, there's a plethora of different technologies that might help the elderly, but one thing that's been shown to work is companionship with something that people can relate to. So in our work with these kinds of robots, whoops, 
we found that people actually really enjoyed working, playing with robots and not with computer characters. They said, oh, that's a TV. I don't want a TV. But they liked the robot. So this was really compelling for us. And then finally, the area that in many ways can, can be the most compelling is working with children. So we work with kids with autism at Children's Hospital. And kids with autism have a problem with social behavior. They don't know how to detect social cues from another person, and they don't know how to act appropriately socially. It's a spectrum disorder, so there are very different manifestations of it across different children, and that's what's challenging. But what we have found is many of them tend to like robots, and if the robots are sophisticated, banded style, so they're sort of like a human, but not a human, then the kids will re relate to them in a peer-to-peer-like fashion, and this might be a way to train social behaviors in children with autism and get them to play with other children and help them out in terms of uh, being part of a, a social interaction in school and at home. So, this is very exciting, um, and we have a, a number of different studies going on in all of these domains, so I encourage you to get to our website, find out, email me, um, but what I want to give you, just as a tiny little taste, I hope again, um, that Bandit will help me out to demonstrate um, an interaction it, which involves imitation. So the idea with imitation is one of the problems that kids with autism have is that they can't imitate what another person is doing. Because in order to imitate, you have to really understand what they're doing, understand the intention, and then map what you see to what you do. This is a very complex skill. If you look at the animal world, very few animals could actually imitate. There's an argument whether any animals other than chimps and dolphins can actually do it. Possibly whales, but it's really hard to test imitation in whales. Um, so I'm not kidding. Whales are smart, but you know, it's hard to kind of hang out with them. So, um, but Bandit can imitate. And so if we can get into a game, and we have done this, both with the elderly users and with kids with autism, and the, I, the interesting notion is if it imitates me and I imitate it, we can get into a game, it can teach me skills, I can teach it skills, we can develop a productive kind of a back and forth. So hopefully I can show that. So let's see. Okay, are you ready? I'm ready. Okay, it's going to show me something, and then I'll try and imitate it. I'm scared. Okay, hands up. I'm doing okay. I'm doing all right. Okay, it bings when I've done it right. Come on. Uh, it's very tricky. You have to do it just so. So depending on how correctly I do it, it can give me more feedback. But we turned it off because I wanted to talk and not let the robot talk. Um, but it could tell me, it can give me all sorts of encouragements. It can tell jokes. Sometimes it does. Sometimes the jokes are bad. Um, <laughs> you know. Um, so, but, but the idea is you can basically get the robot to do anything that personally works for the user. So maybe I don't like jokes, maybe I like sports, maybe I like, obviously I like USC. So I can get a banter going with me and the robot while I exercise and time passes. And also we can switch roles. So I can teach it things and it'll imitate. And we can do this for as long as we can keep going. Um, and then it can get it tougher and tougher, harder and harder from day to day um, to increase the challenge level and keep me from getting bored and keep me improving. So we can keep doing this, but instead, I probably, oh, oh it'll just push me forever, but uh, maybe I'll stop. But enough? Okay, I'm gonna stop. That's enough, I'm really tired. Tired now. Okay, all right, bye. All right, well, that's hopefully a good enough demonstration of the kinds of things we can do, and we can hopefully do much more in the future. Thank you.